Okay, hi there. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Um, thank you very much um, for signing up and attending uh, this webinar hosted by the International Comparative Legal Guide Series in partnership with the Association of Governance, Risk and Compliance. My name is James Strode, publisher of the ICLG series. I just wanted to say uh, that we appreciate your attendance uh, today as we embark on an hour long session uh, looking into the current trends in international sanctions and compliance. Of course, it goes without saying that uh, there's a, a lot of content to get through, both from a topical and geographical perspective. And our panel today will do their very best to provide some high class um, and interactive thoughts uh, around the, the topic of discussion. Alongside the panel, we do, of course, welcome you um, as attendees uh, to contribute as well. The platform today uh, does allow you to, uh, to make questions through the chat box at the bottom. So please do feel free to comment and ask questions. One last piece of housekeeping from me is just uh, so you are aware, today's session is being recorded. Uh, it will be available publicly in the coming week online and available to download as well. So before handing over to the panel, um, just two very brief points uh, to, to run through. Firstly, the ICLG is proud to have launched uh, just yesterday, in fact, our fifth edition of the International Comparative Legal Guide to Sanctions, led by Roberto Gonzalez, partner at the law firm Paul Weiss, based in New York, and a panelist today. The publication provides uh, insights into 18 jurisdictions and, and take deep dives into topics around compliance, enforcement, and litigation. We'll be providing everyone in attendance uh, today an opportunity to download the 2024 publication on a complimentary basis after this webinar. So please do keep an eye out for that communication. Secondly, I would like to thank uh, our partners, um, the Association of Governance, Risk and Compliance. They're a wonderful organization uh, who do so much work to support the GRC community through knowledge exchange, networking and idea incubation. The programs that the AGRC run are raising standards of ethics and integrity in the world of compliance and boosting the industry's knowledge and understanding of best practice, professional development and new technologies. So if you've not seen too much about the AGRC, I'd urge you to go and have a look at their website after this webinar, of course, and reach out to myself or Matteo for more information. And that brings me nicely on to welcome Matteo, Global Manager at the AGRC, and will be our moderator today. So he'll, he'll take it from here. Um, I hope everybody, uh, you enjoy the session, and of course, good luck to the panel. Thank you, James, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to partner up with ICLG and the GLG group uh, to actually put together these uh, webinars and uh, this series of webinars. Hopefully, we'll do uh, several more uh, into 2024. Uh, so, you know, there is no housekeeping from my end. So, we're going to jump straight into uh, the topic uh, of the day. Uh, before actually getting started, I would like uh, the two panelists to introduce themselves. Just tell us a little bit about who you are and what is your interest in sanctions. Uh, Roberto, you want to get us started there, please? Sure. Uh, thank you. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be part of the panel. Uh, my name is Roberto Gonzalez. I'm a partner uh, at Paul Weiss, a law firm in, in, uh, based in New York, but I'm in the Washington, D.C. office. I serve as the uh, co-chair of our sanctions and AML practice group. Um, I uh, counsel uh, financial institutions, technology companies, other types of companies in all manners of sanctions issues, including um, investigations, um, compliance issues, licensing. And um, formerly, I was in the U.S. government in a couple different places. Uh, but for uh, these purposes, most relevantly, I was deputy general counsel of the U.S. Treasury Department, and I had oversight over the uh, the lawyers who served OFAC and also FinCEN, so both the sanctions and the AML side. Um, so very happy to be uh, part of the discussion today. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, last but not least, Martin. Hi, thank you very much indeed. Hello to everyone. Uh, yes, so my name is Martin Schofield. Uh, I'm a financial crime trainer and consultant um, to the uh, mainly to the UK uh, and European uh, regulated and non-regulated market. 
um, but also um, work as a financial crime advisor to the AGRC and have worked in the past on international projects, um, uh, taking me all around the world with financial crime prevention, um, uh, either training or consultancy projects. Uh, and also have been in-house money laundering reporting officer uh, a couple of times on, on one occasion being a group money laundering reporting officer uh, where I had responsibility for financial crime and sanctions compliance in 34 countries around the world. Uh, I think that's why I've got this hairstyle now. Thank you for the introduction, gentlemen. So let, let's get started by sort of setting the stage and kind of summarizing what is going on in the world of uh, sanctions and sanctions compliance these days. So the first question, this one for Roberto to get us started with, is, you know, what are the key recent developments in international economic sanctions and how have these evolved over the past few years? It can be a broad summary because I know a lot of those issues will actually then delve deeper into uh, as the webinar progresses. So Roberto, want to get us started there, please? Yes, uh, happy to. Um, so, you know, I think any discussion about sort of recent trends in sanctions has to, you know, focus primarily on uh, the Russia sanction situation um, following the invasion of Ukraine. Um, we've really seen an unprecedented level of uh, sanctions being leveled on Russia and also an unprecedented level of international sanctions and international cooperation. Um, and so I think one question kind of going forward, um, and I think past this situation is, Will this be the new normal that there's such activity kind of from a number of jurisdictions um, that converge on you know similar countries, similar issues around sanctions? So the Russia sanctions, you know, do not make Russia the most heavily sanctioned um, country in the in the world. Still, there's you know Iran uh, from the U.S. perspective. There's Cuba, Syria, et cetera. But certainly, uh, the number of sanctions on Russia and the complexity and the pace of change. I think is unprecedented. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, I think, later in the session about just the, the different kinds of sanctions that are leveled, at least in the United States, against Russia and the kind of complexity and the compliance footfalls that that creates. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also just in the United States an even higher level of enforcement um, interest and rigor around Russia sanctions. Um, it's been reported, I think people have sort of seen that at least our Deputy Attorney General in the United States Lisa Monaco has said that, you know, sanctions are the new FCPA. So, so sanctions should, should sort of be at the top of the list in terms of corporate compliance, uh, even possibly surpassing or at least equaling anti-corruption. And um, I think that really has been taken to heart by a number of, of companies. I think financial institutions already knew that message, but I think other companies are, are really kind of getting that message now as well. I'll, I'll just mention one other um, sort of trend uh, before we kind of go on in the discussion, which is under um, a law that passed in the United States a couple of years ago, the AMLA Act, there are new whistleblower um, rewards um, for whistleblowers that bring information about sanctions and anti-money laundering violations to U.S. authorities. Um, they can get up to 30 percent of any sort of financial penalty above a million dollars. And um, I have at least hosted a panel recently with U.S. government officials where they have said very sincerely that they have been getting increased tips from a number of uh, whistleblowers and that this is really increasing the kind of quality and volume of reporting. So I think this is another dynamic that's going to fuel enforcement going forward. Thanks, Robert. I think, sorry, Mateo, I was going to say, Go just to add to, to add to that and, and to build on that slightly, I think that's, I mean, that's everything there is absolutely 100% you know, key on point. But I think there's a kind of new development as well and another almost quasi-regulatory factor where we've got the public being involved in sanctions a lot more than we've previously seen since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You know, the, the public has actually taken a view that they don't support it, they don't agree with it, and they're boycotting firms that wish to operate with or in Russia uh, or, or be their partners. So we've seen kind of like a, and that leads into the whistleblowing po point that Roberta has said, there's much more of a kind of different focus um, from the public. Finally, you know, the public have actually taken an interest in sanctions now, whereas before they firmly thought it was something that went on within the finance sector and it didn't really involve them, they didn't have an influence on it. Now the public see they do have a way of, of achieving that. So I think that's a quite an interesting development. Interesting, perfect. So that kind of sets the stage. I mean, we're gonna broach a lot of these different subjects uh, in these 10 questions that we have uh, for, uh, for you listeners today. Uh, so let's get started with, of course, Russia. I mean, Russia has been the focal point for sanctions these days. 
And, uh, you know, could you both provide some insights into the specific sanctions imposed on Russia and their impact on the global financial institutions? Roberto, uh, what's your take on this? Or just kind of provide us with a summary, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm happy to give, a, you know, a, a high level overview. And mm -hmm. I think really the, the takeaway for me is uh, just the different kinds of sanctions being imposed and uh, the complexity that that adds. Um, so, for example, there are region based sanctions. So there are sanctions on um, three regions of uh, Ukraine, Crimea and the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk uh, republics. So these are region based sanctions. And of course, the complexity for financial institutions or any other company trying to respect those sanctions is, you know, how do we exactly know the parameters of this region and how do we know that activity or customers uh, are coming out of this region when it's not sort of a country or there's not a very clear kind of delineation. So region-based sanctions. The next is list-based sanctions. And of course, this is the primary type of sanctions. And it's everything from, and, and I'm talking from a US perspective, uh, please understand, uh, the SDN list, which is the most stringent sanctions list where really all US related transactions are, are, are blocked and prohibited. There are a number of uh, Russian entities, including many Russian oligarchs and wealthy individuals on the SDN list. Over 80% of the banking sector in Russia is basically on a sanctions list. And in addition to the SDN list, however, there are other lists. So there's sectoral sanctions lists, which say that particular types of activities with particular kinds of entities. So for example, lending over a 14 day, more than a 14 day tenor are prohibited. So there's different kinds of lists with different kinds of restrictions. Um, one thing that um, pervades the list is the so-called 50% rule, which says that you know any entity that is uh, directly or indirectly owned by one or more sanctioned entities is, is treated as though it's on the list. And that, of course, creates you know, a number of diligence um, headaches for financial institutions or anyone trying to comply with the list. And then on top of the list-based sanctions, there's a whole host of activities-based sanctions. So in the United States, for example, there's a restriction on new U.S. investment in Russia. And of course, that's a very difficult concept. There's lots of guidance around what that means, what is still, what is still permitted, what is now prohibited. But that has been, at least for our clients uh, who are in, in the investment space, in the banking space, one of the primary, uh, uh, the most troubling um, or most difficult to comply with restrictions. There's also a number of activity-based restrictions on certain services provided by US persons to Russia. So for example, and this list is growing, um, architecture services, engineering, um, corporate formation, accounting, corporate management, uh, trust services, all of these services are now prohibited towards Russian persons. Importantly, US persons are also prohibited from facilitating non-US persons in providing those services. So, for example, if you're a bank and you're lending to an entity that is uh, and it's directly for the provision of these services, that is also prohibited. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and I won't even go into the export restrictions that are administered by um, the Commerce Department, but that are very tied into the U.S. sanctions regime. But it's really this sort of uh, the variety of sanctions and the pace of change that I think makes it uh, most challenging from a compliance perspective. Thank you, Roberto. Martin, anything for you to add there? Or? Um, I mean, obviously, from the UK European perspective, pretty uh -huh. much aligned in the same way. Right. Um, obviously, we've got things here with the we've now got the unexplained wealth orders being used a lot more in the UK, where we're trying to uh, ascertain the wealth behind um, certain people, particularly about Russian oligarchs. We've got the Economic Crime and Transparency Bill designed to try and um, uh, identify true ownership of investment in, in property in the UK so we can uh, prevent that kind of uh, Russian um, ownership of property where there they may be a, a kind of an attempt to avert or divert sanctions. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the other side, that kind of general, oh, it's Russian, so we can't do it, or we shouldn't do it, or do we want to do it? And a very different approach, again, where we're, we're seeing firms not just complying with the sanctions orders or the executive orders or the SDN list, but applying their own list and saying, well, it's it's Russian and we don't want anything to do with it, because this is, has got a humanitarian side to it. This isn't about two governments disagreeing, as as some sanctions in the past have been. This is about a humanitarian element. And so through a sign of um, solidarity, a lot of firms are saying we just simply won't do anything that has a connection to Russia. 
Um, and then the final point we've got, which um, I, I see quite a lot of uh, for sure, is firms not quite sure which side of the fence to jump on, but they know which side their bank has gone on. So they know that their bank won't want to risk, for example, you know, sort of, uh, losing their US dollar trading license. So they know that the bank will want what, what the bank wants. So that's what they follow. So it's not necessarily about what the firm is choosing for itself. It's following the line of its banks. It doesn't want to um, be off boarded from its bank for not complying with the bank's um, uh, um, sanctions. So again, it's kind of another element of sanctions, if like another kind of sanctioning, right. like a secondary sanctions regime. Thank you, Martin. Now, let, let's look a little bit now beyond Russia. I know we've, a, a lot of the focus has been on Russia, and we actually just got a question now from one of the uh, audience members, and basically they want us to touch a little bit uh, on uh, Nicaragua, for example. Uh, but aside from Russia, I mean, what are some of other regions or countries where sanctions have been recently imposed, and what are the primary reasons behind these sanctions? Uh, Roberto, you want to get us started there? I don't know if you can work in Nicaragua into the discussion, too, as that's sure. a question someone's asking. So. Yeah, no, I mean, Nicaragua certainly is on the list in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, newer sanctions that are that are more, you know, limited, of course, but right. that are still important. But um, I guess where I would start that discussion from a U.S. perspective, where we see the most kind of uh, dynamism in, in sanctions outside of Russia is really probably the China context. Um, there are um, a number of sanctions um, affecting China. Um these stem from sanctions having to do with, you know, Hong Kong related activity where um, officials uh, of the Chinese government, but also companies are being sanctioned uh, because of their um, activities towards Hong Kong. Um, there have been no new designations, you know, last year. So it's been a little quiet, but that's a place where we see probably continuing activity. Um, there is the new sanctions regime called the um, China Military Industrial Complex List. This was started by President Trump kind of in the last year of his presidency, and Biden kind of revamped it and took it over. But essentially, these are companies that the U.S. government has said are involved in the Chinese military industrial complex. And um, the restriction on these companies is very specific. It, it's basically that U.S. persons are not allowed to invest in the publicly traded securities of these companies. And there's a number of exceptions and, and guidance around that. But that's another area that is, uh, you know, has caused uh, financial institutions, I think it's uh, leveled out recently, uh, a good amount of uh, compliance consternation. Beyond that, you know, Iran, Syria, um, uh, for the United States, Cuba, these are kind of abiding sanctions um, um, areas. These are comprehensively sanctioned. And we still see a steady stream of enforcement actions coming out of the Treasury Department from OFAC where um, U.S. companies or their non-U.S. subsidiaries are doing business um, with these entities. Sometimes they're doing it in a way where um, the, uh, you know, the Iran-related nature of a payment or a transaction is uh, deleted by employees or somehow elided, but then it's eventually discovered that there are these stream of Iran uh, transactions, and that leads to an enforcement action. And so uh, this is sort of an abiding theme. Uh, but you are right to point out, you know, Nicaragua is an area where there's been, you know, increased sanctions because of uh, the political situation in that country. We've seen it in Afghanistan, where there's um, a very unique situation of a sanctioned in entity, the Taliban, uh, running the government. So figuring out how to do business in a, uh, uh, a place where the country itself is not sanctioned, but the government is run by a sanctioned entity has caused you know, a lot of um, you know, consternation, both on the government side, providing guidance for how to do that, but also you know, um, companies trying to cope with, with how to do business in such an environment. Uh, I'll stop there. There's a longer list, but, um, but that's kind of the, uh, that's a short list, <laughs> short Perfect. version. Yeah. Martin, any, anything from the UK, European perspective? I know another question came here on Australian sanctions. They want uh, some information on the scope of the applicability. I don't know if anyone can comment on that, but Martin, anything uh, from Europe or the UK? Uh, pretty much the same. One yeah. thing, obviously, a lot of increased focus around China, as Roberto said, exactly the same for us. Um, I think one of the focuses although it's not new is a reminder throughout sort of like uh, the uk and europe that the the old sanctions haven't gone away just because russia is here 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's it's, so they're not new, but it's kind of they're, they're being refreshed and reminded, you know, that don't forget these exist. Russia hasn't become the only uh, issue for sanctions. So, yes, still very key issues around Iran uh, and Cuba, et cetera, for us. Um, Australia, sorry, off the top of my head, I don't know the Australian sanctions um, regime intimately. Um, as far as I'm aware, the applicability it will be to Australian entities, Australian persons, Australian uh, um, companies and subsidiaries, etc. I'm not aware of any extraterritoriality that exists within the uh, Australian sanctions uh, regimes. Um, I may be incorrect, but I'm not aware of any. Okay. Thank you, Martin. And Mateo, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Robert. I would just, I would just add. I'm sorry to my to my list, just to make sure I don't neglect this topic. But uh, global Magnitsky sanctions. Um, so, in other words, the U.S. sanctions program that I think is now, you know, you see um, parallels of this in other sanctions. But U.S. sanctions um, involving um, corrupt corruption or human rights abuses, where individuals or companies uh, or or government officials. Um, are sanctioned because of corruption, human rights abuses, similar activity. Um, that has been a very kind of active area of sanctions uh, designation in the last few years in the United States. And this is one that uh, at least our kind of sanctions agency leadership always says is a is a very sort of fertile area for additional um, sanctions. And so I think mm-hmm. this is interesting because these sanctions can apply to individuals and companies in all parts of the world. Um, it's not, you know, it's not really concentrated in particular countries. Um, and sometimes entities that are sanctioned for other reasons are also become sanctioned for, for these reasons. So it's one to, to watch in terms of future kind of a, a future designations. Okay. Uh, the, inter- the upholding of international peace and security and human rights and, uh, and law. Um, yeah, so exactly those points are going to start coming out a lot more. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Let's, let's move now into a bit more of a practical discussion to kind of help organizations either stay up to date or kind of see how they can tackle some of the challenges posed by uh, by these sa- uh, sanctions regimes. So the question here for Martin is, you know, how can organizations in the financial services sector stay updated on the latest sanctions and compliance requirements in a rapidly changing geopolitical landscape? Martin, what would, you, what would your tips be, I guess, for, for organizations? Well, congratulations on getting through the question. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, primarily it does, it, it comes from a starting place is a, a point of knowledge. Understanding mm-hmm. your business, your business's scope, where you operate, where your customers operate, where your footfall goes within your your business profile, and then understanding from there what the sanctions are within those you know, within those countries where your your business operation goes, so that you have a good understanding of the of the model where you're actually you know what touch points do you have in what countries? What are the sanctions in those countries? How do they impact you? So, for example, you know, just talking about Australia, how does doing business with Australia, if you're headquartered in the UK with a subsidiary in the US, how does that actually impact you from from a a business flow perspective? So getting that kind of good basic knowledge of of, of your organisation and your organisation's footfall is going to be the first point. Identifying the sources of information that are available to you, so familiarising yourself with the authorities and the the, uh, bodies in each of those countries that will issue sanctions, familiarizing yourself with terminology, how they issue the sanctions, what they look like, how they uh, are typically applied, so that you've got a good knowledge base. Um, it sounds so logical, but it's the point that we find is, is absent so, so frequently, that when you speak to the people that are responsible, the compliance officers, the MLROs, they have a program in place to screen for sanctions, They understand how they do the screening, but they don't understand the bit before so well. Maybe they inherited it from when they joined the firm. It's an existing process. So understanding where your footfall is, why you're generating responses, why you're checking these things, how it impacts you if you're in a different country. How does that impact your trade flow? Um, And I think it's kind of that. just remembering as well, it's not a set and forget process. You know, so it's just because it worked once doesn't mean to say it's going to work tomorrow. So keeping up to date with what's going on in the world, which a lot of the service providers, the screening providers that firms use, uh, they have that that, that service where they update you on additional sanctions, what's happening, what's new. Um, But I think it's it's about the resource availability to be able to interpret that and understand it and and apply it rather than simply thinking it's okay, the screening provider's done it for us. 
So keeping up to date with with that, you know, obviously watching world news, getting reliable sources of information. An awful lot of um, law firms, in particular, offer free um, sort of like notifications and updates, you know, weekly updates on what's going on in the world and things. Um, so those kind of valued and trusted sources of information are, are very useful too. Excellent. Roberto, anything to add as a, you know, someone who works in a law firm? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, certainly, you know, watch for our client alerts, which we, we do try to put out uh, based on uh, uh, significant U.S. developments. Uh, no, but I would just say, and I, I agree with everything Martin's saying, I, I do think that especially as the pace of developments, you know, hastens, really uh, banks and other companies are really facing a, an avalanche of not only sort of the sanctions changing, but a series of uh, guidance documents, advisories, alerts from, um, at least in the United States, OFAC, FinCEN, other agencies. And it's just very hard sometimes to keep up on all of them, but it's, it's very important to do so. Um, you know, I think, for example, if you're going to go do, you know, start, you know, new business in China, for example, you know, you really should make sure that you've seen the guidance document, at least from the U.S. perspective on, you know, doing business in the Xinjiang province and making sure that you're avoiding issues of forced labor or other kinds of human rights issues that can have sanctions and other issues. If you don't have that guidance document, if you've not read through the, the red flags and also the list of entities that are discussed, you know, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I think another important issue is it's not just the guidance documents and advisories, but it's really keeping up on, uh, you know, the steady pace of OFAC and other agency enforcement actions, because every enforcement action has a valuable lesson for your company mm -hmm. as to kind of what went wrong, what are some ways of uh, in ensuring that doesn't go wrong in your business. Um, when I was in the government, one of our kind of leaders said that, you know, it's compliance malpractice to not keep up on the enforcement actions and think about how they apply to your situation, how to spread the word in your organization. Like, let's not find ourselves in this situation doing this. Let's, let's prevent it by doing X, Y, and Z. So I think that, I mean, it's a very <laughs> labor intensive job to even keep up on all of this, but I think it's, you know, if you're an international company that's doing, you know, significant international business, I think it's a necessity. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Roberto. Uh, let's look at some of the challenges. I know we've touched upon them uh, throughout this first half an hour, uh, basically looking at what are the most common challenges that financial institutions face when it comes to complying with these sanctions. Uh, Martin, do you want to summarize things neatly into a nice little, you know, gift with a bow and, you know, tie it all up for us? Resource. <laughs> resource? Yeah, resource. <laughs> That's it. But having the resource to be able to um, investigate the footfall of the business so you know where your sanctions are, uh, what countries you're dealing with, what those sanctions are, how they apply to your business. Having the resource to be able to then interpret the information that comes out of all of these trusted you know, advisory places to, to, to know when there's updates or changes. Having the resource to be able to review the parameters that you screen your, your customer base uh, against. Um, having the ability to, to include within that resource, not just your customers, but, you know, obviously beneficial ownership um, and company structures, directors, uh, trustees, beneficiaries. Uh, and then before you even walk into the, the, the world of should we also be screening our business partners and our service providers, our agents, our brokers, our intermediaries um, yeah, and, and, and staff, uh, all of which have the ability to, to, to fall on a sanctions list potentially. So having the resource to be able to get that far, then have the resource to be able to review any outputs from the screening, mm -hmm. um, so, which, you know, as we know, when, you know, as we've spoken about with the, the number of sanctions that were already in place, then added all of the additional Russian sanctions, you know, the resource is, is, is huge in order to be able to manage the output of, of screening. And the, the, the risk is that the biggest risk for that is that firms don't have that resource. So mm -hmm. they then tweak their screening parameters to reduce the amount of potential false positives that they get. And the more you tweak those parameters that were once set at a level that you were comfortable with, but now the amount of false positives you're getting requires you by your resource to be able to, you know, to have to reduce and, and amend your parameters. Um, that puts you in a huge regulatory risk circle because now the regulator can look at you and say you're actually governing your screening parameters to fit the resource you have to review the output rather than having the parameters set to address your risk mm 
Um, and from that perspective, simply, you know, that you, you've just kind of opened up the checkbook for the regulator for them to say your systems and controls are failing. Um, and then coupled into that, understanding the the way that your screening works. Um, yeah, I've I've audited, consulted, done lots of work with firms, and when I talk to them about their screening process, they say, do you have you know static or fuzzy logic? Uh, they say, oh, fuzzy. And I say, and what does it mean? And they say, eighty percent match rate. And I say, eighty percent of what? And that's where the conversation ends, because there's not enough knowledge about the back end of it. Um, so there's that. And then the final piece is just remembering that sanctions don't stop with the US, the UK, the UN and the EU. You know, there are lots of other countries issue sanctions. Um, so not so much of a nice little package with a bow, I'm afraid, but hopefully lots of information on the bow. Excellent. Uh, Roberto, anything to add there in terms of challenges or anything different? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, with that list, I mean, I when I think about sort of the common places, you know, where there's foot faults and potential, you know, enforcement exposure, you know, I think um, I think Martin is right that a lot of it is around just the actual sanction screening itself. I think there there maybe used to be a view that you know if you have screening in place and um, even if there's mistakes, um, you know, the regulator will will probably give you a pass. But what we've seen from OFAC's, you know, recent enforcement actions is that, no, they, as Martin said, they want you to understand the mechanics of the sanction screening. They want you to be able to assess whether there are kind of gaps or holes in how sanction screening works. And uh, they want you to, you know, continually assess the, the nature of the screening and test it. And then... Um, you know, in terms of reviewing alerts, you know, there have been a number of OFAC enforcement actions where there's just sort of, uh, frankly, a series of bloopers in terms of how the alerts are screened, right? There's five different analysts looked at something where there's an alert and they close the alert for no, you know, explicable reason. Um, you know, things kind of just get lost, even though there are alerts that, that happen. So I think, you know, screening and screening snafus is, is certainly a key area of enforcement risk. I would say just another big theme of enforcement recently from OFAC is, you know, when a company is obtaining in its ordinary course of business, certain information like customer name or customer country or customer IP address, or even sometimes, you know, the names of the customer's customers, if they're receiving that information in the ordinary course, it seems like OFAC's kind of guiding principle is, okay, if you receive the information, you have to screen it. And it's not just the names you have to screen, but it's the country or IP address to see if, you know, a, a customer or a counterparty is in a comprehensively sanctioned jurisdiction. Um, so I think that what that means for companies is, well, we have to really think critically about what is the information that we're receiving, even if we're not receiving it for compliance purposes, but we're receiving it for, you know, business purposes. Uh, there's still an expectation that you're going to do something with that information. So I think finding those issues, closing those gaps is really important. And I'll just list a, a third issue where we've just seen a lot of uh, OFAC enforcement activity. And that's around um, you know, M&A activity where a company acquires a new company or acquires a new business line. Um, you know, it should be doing pre-transaction due diligence about the sanctions compliance of that entity. And once it acquires the entity, it should put you know, it sanctions controls into place to make sure that there are you know, uh, no sanctioned activity that should not be taking place. There have been a series of OFAC enforcement actions where that process is, has fallen apart, where there is not sufficient pre-transaction diligence or sufficient steps post-transaction to really put in place an effective sanctions program. Sometimes there's actually, there are those actions taking place, but there are frankly, rogue employees in the acquired business that that want to continue to do the business with their Iranian customers because it's a profit center and, you know, they don't want to be told otherwise. And there, OPAC has faulted the management of the company for not monitoring and auditing sufficiently to make sure that your controls are being put in place. And what we've seen over and over again is that companies are being held to account for the actions of their rogue employees. That's a very common sort of pattern in enforcement. So I would say that those, I mean, there's other areas too, but those three areas to me at least are sort of some of the main themes of enforcement activity that, that everyone should keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I think Thank Mateo you, as well, just before we move off quickly on the second point, absolutely again, through obviously the UK and EU on the collection of data, you know, the GDPR and the UK GDPR, 
really seriously focused everyone's attention on what they're doing with regards to data protection and how much information they do or don't collect and making sure they don't over collect. Um, but at the same time, there is still this risk, quite rightly, as Roberto says, that it's kind of be careful what you ask for, because the more information you get, the more information that's on your records, even if you don't really consider it to be you know that essential to the, the piece of business that you're undertaking, but nonetheless, you've collected it. If that includes names and addresses, you've got a position where you could be you know on the wrong side of enforcement action if you didn't screen those names and addresses. So you know you really do have to be careful what you ask for and what you what you collect because if it's in your possession through the course of your business activity, then you have a liability to to be able to ensure that 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 person isn't sanctioned. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we have a question here on uh, basically the question was you know can you discuss the extraterritorial impact of sanctions? However, we got a question here from uh, one of the um, one of the attendees. And I'm going to read it out. And again, it has to do with extraterritoriality. Uh, but the question says, uh, you touched on uh, the extraterritoriality issue before. In the EU regime, the non-extraterritoriality is sort of a core principle, and the EU institutions feel so proud about it. What are your thoughts on this? And do you feel this ma this is maximalist and somewhat naive approach is this maximalist and somewhat naive approach is cracking? Uh, Roberto, any thoughts on that? <laughs> um I think I will maybe um, limit my remarks to the U.S. regime mm -hmm. and its extraterritorial, or at least it's um, what's described sometimes uh -huh. as extraterritoriality. And I think, um, you know, for U.S. sanctions, you know, they primarily apply to U.S. persons. But the big uh, caveat to that is that they also apply to non-U.S. persons in many mm -hmm. situations. And so if you're a non-U.S. person, if you're a company, you know, sitting in France or in, in China, et cetera. And if you're doing activity that um, that involves at least what we call just to as a as a, a just a useful term, a US nexus, so some kind of connection to the United States, then the US government will believe that its its US sanctions laws applies to that activity. So for example, mm -hmm. if you're doing business, if you're in China, you're doing business with um, you know, a counterparty in Iran, it's all non-US business. You know, that's all fine. However, if you're using um, U.S. dollar payments that flow through a U.S. bank or through a non-U.S. branch of a U.S. bank, that is what creates the U.S. nexus. And that's what leads the U.S. government to believe that its sanctions laws applies to that activity. So that's, you know, a very common pattern of enforcement actions where it's purely non-U.S. business, as far as you could tell, except it involves <laughs> payments that go even momentarily to the U.S. financial system. Mm -hmm. You know, another example of that is, you know, totally non-U.S. business, but the goods that are being sold were originally kind of U.S. manufactured goods. That's another place where at least the U.S. government believes the law kind of follows the goods. Um, another area you see this is really with just sort of kind of complex technologies and infrastructure that you think you're doing U.S. business, but some of the systems you're using actually flow through servers in the United States in the United States or take make use of other US based technology or infrastructure that's another way that the US government says that its law applies and so this could strike people as very unfair it could take people as unaware but this is sort of the very established kind of position of the US government as to how its mm -hmm. sanctions flow so and i think sometimes the US government is not completely clear at least on the OFAC website that you know Many times, non-U.S. persons are subject to these restrictions if some of their business, you know, touches or their transactions touch the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. Um, territory or U.S. institutions. So, um, you know, whether it's fair or not or correct or not, I just think it's very important for people to understand that that's that's the way the U.S. Gov um, sanctions function, and to sort of plan it plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. Your perspective, Martin. Um, yeah, obviously, I'll, I'll try and come from the other side of the other side of the pond. So the UK um, and the European element. So yes, obviously, I mean, from the UK's perspective, the UK up until Brexit was always always carried what was known as the HMT consolidated list. It still does post Brexit. We still consolidate the European sanctions uh, and the uh, United Nations sanctions into our sanctions list. Um, and obviously, the EU has you know, every EU member state is required to comply with. Um, EU sanctions and the EU sanctions also take uh, cognizance of the UN sanctions. 
so whilst we've all got the kind of you know the, the, the requirement there is that extraterritoriality within the european sanctions insofar as they travel throughout europe um they don't necessarily travel outside of europe um or at least they don't travel so well uh and I don't know, from an interesting perspective, everybody knows that the US sanctions have extraterritoriality. We all know that there's that risk that Roberta has just very cleverly and, and carefully described. And we all know about that. And we're all very cognizant of it. And you know, when you speak to financial institutions, the one thing they don't want to do is breach the US sanctions, uh, even if they're a, a non-US based company. But they have, as Roberta says, they have you know US dollar trading license, for example. Um, but you don't get the same kind of um, dare I use the word scared approach um, for, for non-compliance with the EU sanctions. And I just wonder whether that's because we don't see the same significant enforcement action coming out of the EU. Um, so yes, there is the extraterritoriality, particularly around the, you know, the European member states, but we don't see the publication, at least if there are any, or they're certainly not, and when we do see them, they're not in the same magnitude as the US sanctions. Um, and I, I feel that that's, you know, the, the Europe, EU and UK, for example, are kind of poorer for that, um, because the focus is always we need to comply with sanctions. But when you ask people, you know, priority list, it's always OFAX at the top. Um, so I think, you know, maybe maybe there's more enforcement work that could be done that would actually equal that balance a little bit. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's shift gears now a little bit. We still have another 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so. Uh, let's look at compliance technology and tools. And basically the question is, you know, what are some of, what are some best practices that financial institutions should consider to ensure they're in full compliance with sanctions requirements? Uh, this was from Martin. We have a question that came in too, which I think we can tie it into that. And the question is basically, to what extent can companies rely on information provided to them by information service providers, such as World Check One Refinitiv, for example? So let's talk about data, information, technology. Uh, Martin. Yeah, sure. So um, you are entitled to rely on, rely on that information um, in order to inform your decision and your, um, your, your business activity. Uh, so you can use those providers. That's what they're there for. They're recognized providers. Uh, the key to that, which kind of builds into the, the, the original question as well around the, the, what you need to do for the you know, for, for technology and tools is understanding how it works. Um, one of the key findings in the UK since, oh gosh, for over about 10, 15 years now, uh, has always been around how much you understand the technology that you're using. So not, it's not good enough to say we've got it in place. Um, it's come from World Check One, so therefore it's good, isn't it? You have to understand how it works. Um, now, some providers um, will, for example, import the sanctions lists from another provider. So when you're updating your sanctions, the data you're using has traveled through two firms. Other firms might might um, import it from a third provider. So by the time you've got the data that you're screening your 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 customer base against, it's actually gone through three different providers before it reaches you. What the regulators expect is that you understand that journey exists because you need to understand where that is, but where the risk is of whether you're screening against up to date information or not. Because if the sanctions list is coming via three companies before it hits your screening tool, then what happens if one of those companies falls over if the if the if the chain breaks? So being able to understand how your um, data is imported to you is absolutely key. Uh, equally, things some of the things are just so simple. You know, I mentioned earlier being able to describe the difference between what you mean by static and fuzzy logic, and what do you what are your fuzzy logic parameters? Uh, so I get people saying to me, "Oh, it's eighty percent. Eighty percent of what? First name, last name, middle name, date of birth, passport, geographical location, known as alias." All of those things, if you're screening them, do you have to score 80% of all of them to get a return? Or do they have to score less than 80% in order to, 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 to not give you a return? So understanding how your parameters actually work. Uh, and you know, one of the other key ones, which is really quite, um, quite common, is firms get an email notification in the morning from their service provider to tell them that they have reviews to, to, to check. You think, great, we have some reviews to check. What does it mean if you don't get that email? And I've been asking this of a number of client firms over the last few weeks, actually, and they all say the same thing. Um, not sure. No, no, no alerts to review, I think. And I straight away you think, okay, so we've got not sure, 
no alerts to review, I think. That's not going to withstand regulatory scrutiny. I think and not sure the regulators aren't going to like. So, But what does it mean if you don't get that email in the morning to tell you that you've got alerts to review? Does it mean that you don't have any alerts to review? Or does it mean that the system fell over last night and you ha haven't even been screened? And for every kind of on, on the doom and gloom side, you know, for every minute that goes by that you're screened, you know, you're conducting business with customers who haven't been screened against the sanctions list because it fell over last night and you don't know it. For every minute, you need to kind of convert minutes to, to pounds or dollars. And so that's that's a fine. For every minute you, you're trading, that's another pound or dollar that you're going to get fined for trading with people that are sanctioned. So it's, it's kind of a the, the overall things. Yes, you can rely on the information, providing you've done the research to tell you that that reliance is, is valid and that you, know, you should be able to do it. If it's three providers long before it gets to you, then I would say, well, no, why would you rely on it? Because you you don't know what's happening to it in that journey. Um, so you can you can use trusted providers, trusted service providers, by all means. Their data should be able to be relied upon, but you can't rely on the data to make the decision. You can rely on the data to inform your decision and you can then conduct your own investigations, make your own inquiries if you need to. Uh, but the, uh, the information, that the uh, the providers uh, should be giving you should be direct downloads from the relevant authorities. So from the EU, the UN, OFAC and UK, for example. So that the data that your customer base is being screened against should be an exact lift out of the uh, out of the sanctions lists. Um, but you need to make sure that you understand that perfectly well and that that journey hasn't been hampered and you you, you therefore can place that that trust. And one of the biggest things the UK uh, regulator has said, for, say, for many, many years, is if you can't explain how your, your controls work, if you don't know how they work, then you won't know if they stopped working. And if you don't know that they've stopped working, then they may as well be absent. So you can have perfectly good operating systems, but if you can't explain how they work, then it's likely you could still be fined by the regulators for having absent systems and controls. Thank you, Martin. Roberto, anything to add there? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I, I'll just add kind of one other element to kind of understanding how your systems work. Another thing to watch out for, and this is based on, you know, prior client matters where, you know, there have been issues. And, and that's the issue of, of, of data quality and data integrity. So, you know, you have customer information, address information, et cetera, that data kind of flows into a system that is then sanction screened, right? And then there's alerts that come out. Well, what happens if all, if the, the part of the customer data is not properly flowing into the sanction screening tool? You know, so what example, what, for example, if, what if there are character limits in the amount of data that can flow over? And what happens is that systematically, you know, it's the country at the end of the address or the, or the country code or the zip code is kind of lopped off <laughs> before it goes into the sanction screening filter. You know, this, this is a you know, true life example. Um, you know, so uh, the sanction screening is working as it should. It just doesn't have the right information or the complete information that it's supposed to be acting upon. And you know, how do you as a company sort of detect that this is happening, right? And how do you know that because of some recent systems change, it maybe was working before, but because of some recent change, it now is not working. So. This just is, I think, underlines Martin's point about sort of continually, you know, testing and trying to understand how your systems work. Um, I think we've seen in the, um, some of the banks will be familiar with the New York Department of Financial Services um, regulation, so-called Part 504. And I think they, I think very astutely have on their list of things to check and to certify compliance for every year that it's not just the sanction screening program, it's not just the transaction monitoring program, but it's data integrity, you know, making sure that the data flows properly. So I would just sort of underline that for really, you know, any company that has these systems, that that's a very important thing to, to check uh, for sanctions compliance. I think just before we move off of that point, but to expand on that, just as this isn't a kind of, you know, what firms need to do, but a word of warning, 
um, around the data integrity and data quality, a couple, couple of things. First of all, when you have joint accounts or joint policies, whatever they may be, very few, if any, sanctions list have Mr. and Mrs. listed on them. So if your policy shows or your account shows Mr. and Mrs. or Mr. and Mr. or Mrs. and Mrs. or whatever, it's unlikely to hit. If you're doing a direct lift and dump from the from your customer database, you're not going to hit any sanctions uh, because you're not going to create any matches. Uh, the other thing to be as a kind of warning, because I have seen this, uh, this is a, a real example, when firms are looking to uh, build new products or services, and they use their own existing data, or um, they use a combination of existing data, or they make up data for a test environment to see how well the system will operate. Um, I have seen it where they have used data and they've amalgamated different names and unfortunately created names that are on the sanctions lists. And so when they then run this test data through their sanction screening, they realize to their detriment, obviously, that they've actually got a sanctioned body or person on their books and they report it. And then it turns out that they haven't. Um, they've just made up the name when they merge data together to do a, to create a test environment. So again, with the use of data, just be mindful that if you're, you know, when you're testing, if you're using it for testing purposes, uh, or you're making up names, just be mindful that that could then trigger an automatic alert somewhere that gets reported, and then you're going to look rather embarrassed when you have to to, to admit to that. Perfect. Thank you, Martin. We have a couple of questions here that have rolled in from users since we have another 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. Uh, I will throw these out there and then I have one last question to kind of wrap up the discussion uh, nicely. Uh, this one is related to what we have been discussing, but how can users be comfortable that the screening companies actually cover all the various sanction regimes? Have you had any experience with that, uh, Martin or Roberto? Um, that comes down to your um, onboarding uh, uh, procedures when you're using them. That you, again, it's that kind of you know, how can we be sure they do our job for us? Um, doesn't work that way. You know, how can you be sure you do your job? Is the is the correct way? So it comes down to your onboarding when you're onboarding a screening partner. Um, you know, you, you will make sure that you, you know that they have the procedures in place. It's down to you. The responsibility is always yours. You can, you know you can get the screening partners in place to help you with the screening. But the responsibility to comply is always going to be down to you. Um, so, you know, it's it's it's, uh, yeah, it's like saying we've employed a new office cleaner. How are we going to make sure that they do their cleaning? Well, it's down to you to check if the office is clean the next day. Um, you know, so it's you, you can you can take some level of comfort that they're a, an internationally recognized um, provider. Um, so, you know, there's going to be good controls there. But it's down to you to make sure that you understand those controls. You've researched them. You've challenged them as well. If things don't look right, then you go back to the provider and say, but how does that give me protection? Uh, because, you know, they're the questions that you might have to answer in front of the regulator. And it doesn't matter in, in the grand scheme of things how much of a reliable third party provider you engage, how good the system is, how wonderful the AI is. All of those things are, are great additions, but none of them will be sitting in front of the regulator answering questions during a supervision interview. Thanks, Martin. Roberto, anything to add there? Or... No, no, nothing. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We have another question here. Again, we're going back to the topic of the theme of Russia. But uh, the question is, in your opinion, what sort of US, EU and UK sanctions against Russia one should expect if and when the next round of measures is imposed by respective authorities? Any predictions there uh, from what you've seen, read, et cetera? Ones that work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would, I, I think it's sort of just a continuation of what we've mm -hmm. seen. I think there's sort of this, you know, there's, more entities, more sectors to, to sanction. And I think, um, you know, my guess would be that U.S. government and other governments will just continue to you know, tighten the screws and, and increase the sanctions. So, for example, the statistic the government gives is that about 80 percent of the Russian banking sector is, is subject to sanctions right now. So, you know, many companies that are trying to continue doing business in Russia have to go to the you know small number of banks that are able to that are not sanctioned still able to do the transactions. I would imagine the U.S. government is going to continue to sanction <laughs> banks to make it even more difficult to do those right. transactions. I also think that um, you know in addition to companies being sanctioned, there's been a pattern of senior executives, uh, individuals being sanctioned, and I think that there's probably just a lot more executives, individuals, probably oligarchs 
that can also be sanctioned. So I think that that's going to increase as well. And then finally, at least from the U.S. perspective, you know, the U.S. has also, um, you know, made announcements that, uh, you know, particular sectors are of particular interest to uh, for the U.S. government in terms of further sanctioning. And that list is now um, a pretty long list. So it's, it's everything from uh, uh, architecture to quantum computing to obviously defense and, and kind of high technology, uh, mining and metals. So it's a pretty long list. Uh, it doesn't mean that the whole sector is sanctioned, but just that if you're an entity in that se sector in Russia, then you, know, you should be careful and your counterparty should be careful because you might be sanctioned next. I think they might follow through and actually sanction more entities in those sectors, but also they might add more sectors to that list. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, um, you know, I, I've heard U.S. government officials describe the overall strategy as, you know, start high. They started with actually a pretty significant kind of level of sanctions, but that keep, you know, aim high, like keep it, <laughs> keep it going, keep it ratcheting up over time. And so that's, that's what I expect that we'll see, you know, as, as time goes on and, you know, who knows when the situation will, Right. The change. Right. Martin, anything to add from the UK EU perspective or uh, no, apart from just you know, to ex expand on my the, that glib comment at the beginning of the ones that work, you know, and, but there mm. that is what I would hope to see the little bit more, maybe a little bit more intelligent application rather than the kind of this the, the global blanket of let's just pile on more sanctions on top of the ones we've got. You know, if the sanctions ever to work, you know, the, the, the body that is being sanctioned has to be you know, essentially smaller and less able to survive than the, the party that is imposing the sanctions. Uh, and in reality, I think what we're seeing is, well, what we've seen is no change in the behavior of, of Russia uh, in the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but what we have seen on the other side of the coin is, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, world trade has, has uh, slowed down. Um, you know, we've got a, an, an international crisis of, of um, economy and uh, people are struggling perhaps more than ever to put food on their tables in a lot of countries uh, because of, um, you know, sort of uh, food chain supplies and, and things uh, all being hampered or delayed through the sanctions and, and everything that's in place for Russia. So, you know, obviously I, I, I am not UK government, I'm not U EU government, but what I'd like to see is, you know, hopefully... Um, something that actually will have an impact um, on the party that we're trying to sanction and not the people that are that, that are imposing the sanctions, something that equals the balance a little bit more. What those sanctions will be, I don't know, but it's very easy for you know, a country to, um, as, as, as the size of Russia, to create its own infrastructure so that it can still carry on being who it is. Um, and again, you know, when, when you don't have a, 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 a country that is run... Um, in, in, in a kind of democratic way, uh, then sanctions, again, they just come down to whether one person decides whether we're going to, you know, whether I'm going to change my mind or not. Uh, so that hopefully something that's a little bit more effective, a little bit more hitting that's, that's going to be in place. But what that will be, I don't know. Okay, thanks for that. We have one final and, question. Go uh, ahead, Roberto. Yep. I'm sorry, Matteo. Let me just briefly add just one other yep. element in terms yep. of predictions of a uh, future mm -hmm. designation. So, you know, a big focus by the U.S. government, and I, I believe other governments, is just the question of sanctions evasion. So, you know, entities and individuals that are in the business of evading U.S. sanctions and U.S. export controls by, you know, setting up shell companies, uh, you know, being anonymous and funneling funds and equipment and supplies to Russia. So U.S. government has now started sanctioning uh, these suspected um, evasion networks in large numbers. And many of those, some of those are in Russia, but many of those are in third countries. So in Turkey and UAE and China, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there have been 300 plus designations along those lines of evasion of evaders or suspected evaders. I think that's a, a big focus of the government. I, 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 I think that's a strong trend going forward. I think there'll be a number of other kind of so-called or at least alleged evasion networks that will be sanctioned going forward. And oftentimes those might be you know, companies that do, you know, a good amount of international business that might have legitimate operations. And so it's very important for companies to be on uh, uh, the watch out that their counterparties or their vendors are not, you know, sanctioned on those lists. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. To kind of wrap things up and, uh, you know, uh, provide a final summary or some parting thoughts, uh, you know, uh, following this discussion. The question is, you know, how can organizations strike a balance between compliance with international sanctions and maintaining their global business operations and partnerships? 
I think that's one good final question to wrap everything up and provide some, you know, parting thoughts to uh, people who have been uh, listening to you guys. Uh, Martin, you want to get started there? Carefully. Carefully? <laughs> yeah, carefully. I think, you know, the it comes down to understanding your footprint and your global exposure. Um, you know, so understanding where your business operates and where your potential sanctions risks will come from. Um, and that obviously comes down to, you know, to understanding your customers. So it comes down to a lot of the KYC, CDD that you undertake on your customers, understanding if they're corporates, where their customers are, uh, where's the money flow coming into your organization. Uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier, understanding the risk flow as well. So something that's within your risk tolerance may not be within your bank's risk tolerance. Um, so, you know, so understanding where the money's coming into your organization, what kind of sanctions regimes that money is going to hit along the way, whether it's then going to represent uh, a breach of sanctions or, as Roberto said, a, you know, a sanctions evasion technique um, during that journey, uh, and whether you're you're happy with accepting that risk, and if you are, would your bank be uh, just as happy when they you know when you try and put the money into their organisation? Um, and then finally, I think just making sure you're in there from the beginning on product development, on um, uh, any new launches, any marketing, uh, et cetera, and so forth, making sure you're not the last call on the list, making sure you're up there right from the front to be able to say from the get-go, we can't do that because that's going to cause us a sanctions issue. Um, we know that from that perspective, as you know, lawyers or compliance officers or MLROs, we're never the popular invitee to the party because we're likely to say, no, you can't do that. That's going to cause us an issue. Um, but I think, you know, it's one of those things we're better to, to know from the start that we can't do it rather than proceed and then find ourselves on the wrong end of a, a, a sanctions order. Thank you, Martin. Roberto, your parting thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I agree with everything Martin said, um, you know, particularly the point about um, you know, the compliance needing to be part of really product development, uh, systems changes. Uh, they have to be in the know in order to kind of spot the risks um, and, and, have, and figure out how to manage them. You know, I will say that you know, even though, yes, compliance is sometimes the last to be invited to the table, um, it's a cost center, et cetera. You know, there is a sense, though, in which if you do invest in your compliance uh, procedures and your, your talent, and you have you know nimble and thoughtful compliance processes and systems. There is a sense in which, though, that that allows you to do you know broader and more complicated business than if you had you know very uh, rudimentary compliance procedures, right? So, you know, if you have rudimentary compliance procedures, you really should avoid higher risk jurisdictions, higher risk services more generally, right? Because you you can't really identify and handle the risks. But if you have good compliance and thoughtful, you know, monitoring, you can actually operate in higher risk jurisdictions and in higher risk service lines and business lines because you're actually able to sort of, you know, thoughtfully manage the risk and be, and be able to demonstrate to someone after the fact if something goes wrong that, you know, you did X, Y, and Z, you know, things to, you know, um, appropriately manage the risk. Sometimes things go wrong. But it actually allows you to, you know, to actually expand your business as opposed to con contract it. So I think that's, you know, I think that's one uh, idea that, you know, certain companies are taking to heart. Uh, but, you know, again, it's it is always a, a constant struggle to get adequate resources and, and talent for for the compliance function. Excellent. Thank you, Roberto. Gentlemen, this has been a pleasure. I know James is going to pop back on to say goodbye on behalf of uh, GLG and ICLG. Uh, it has been a very, very insightful discussion. I hope uh, everyone uh, has enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, if you have any questions, we can forward them to both Martin and Roberto, and I'm sure they'd uh, be happy to engage with you and, you know, provide some more details uh, on uh, on these topics. So on behalf of AGRC, you know, thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to James to give us some parting talks of his own. Thank you. We can't hear you, James technology fails at the last i wanted to say, i just wanted to say thank you very much to 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 all three of you for a stimulating hour uh it, it's flown by and dare i say if we were to do this um next month we could fill another hour on a whole bunch of other topics and probably indeed uh, an, another hour on top of that about the updates and changes 
from what we've spoken to uh, about today. Um, so I hope everybody that's tuned in has found it as useful and dynamic and as interesting uh, as I have. Um, do keep your eyes peeled for more from the ICLG team around our sanctions resources. Please do take a look at the AGRC website. And, and as Matteo said, if, if you have any questions at all, please do reach out to us and we can field those as appropriate. So thanks again to Martin, Roberto and Matteo. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Goodbye. All. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.